Okay, uh, very very interesting. Uh, those are the, the the collection rates. As you can see, uh, there is a D, and it's always when you have a deposit system. You know, always when you have a deposit system that you have a high high collection rate. The next meeting, we'll have a next meeting actually, that's going to be the 20th of March. This is going to be about collection and sorting. Uh, how are we how are going to achieve uh, this collection and sorting? It doesn't mean, because if you look at Belgium, Belgium is doing very well, and they will be here, and they will be here on the 20th to explain how they manage, because here they manage 85, I think. Huh? I don't see it, but they should, they should manage 85 percent, and they will go to the 90 percent. Uh, huh? There is no doubt. So they will explain. Uh, Anne Vossen will, will come and explain uh, how they do it, and uh, she will, I would say, be uh, confronted with uh, deposit system people. It's going to be interesting. Uh, but it's not what, what we don't care whether it's uh, coming from curbside or if it's coming from deposit. What is important at the end of the day is that the product is collected. Uh, now, what I was saying to you earlier on, if you can see, it's going be much more than that. Look, okay, this is the this is the the, the recycling capacities, 2017-2018. Here you have a, um, a capacity of recycling of two million one hundred, okay, and the input is only one point eight million, okay. So that's at least two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand over capacity and this has been going on for since the beginning there have been always over capacities of pet recycling uh, in europe always 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 we were working always and i'm i've been recycling i was the third recycler in europe the first one in france and since the beginning in 1991 we the collection was always behind the starting blocks always 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 and no matter what some people were making money, were luckier some years than others, okay? All right, not very well. And, um, and uh, some others, uh, no, we, were, we always ran at 75% capacity. Now, um, the, important, the collection rate today are uh, only on average, around the bottles. Unfortunately, not on trays. We should, uh, we should um, recycle trays also. Huh? Okay, the SUP, uh, we have a, uh, it's a good, sorry, a good acronym for SUP, which is superb. Huh? Single-use plastic easily recycled bottle. And this is, and this is true. This is true. Come from an Englishman, you know, so it's not me. We said that. Trades are defined in SUP directive with sort of uh, for, for, for consumption. This is contrary, we, this is what we say, of the SUP directive, because we should have, we should have, all the trays. Why? 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 Why do we collect uh, bottles and why not trays? This is historical because at the beginning, you know, we had only manual sorting, only manual sorting, and uh, the easiest was to to take bottles. Now we have we can, um, mechanical sorting. Okay, it's automatic sorting, and you can very easily sort the trays. And in Belgium, this is what they're doing. They are going to to have more fractions than, for example, uh, in France. So if you want, uh, that's why Belgium is a good model, because it, um, you know, it's, they're always good to, uh, that's why I present them as much as I can, because it's really, uh, it's really the model today for curbside. And we're gonna have, they are going to, they are going to give us, uh, well, some, I suppose, to trays, huh? All right, let's hurry up a bit. A chemical recycling, this is all starting up, but I can tell you that all the producers, they know exactly what sort of, uh, those, those, this is gonna be wall to wall. There are different technologies, I don't have time to tell you, okay? But all the producers know exactly, uh, next door to their plant, what, what they are going to take. So as I said, either we, we, we will be able, thanks to chemical recycling, we will be able to take open bottles, we will be able to take trays, multi-layer trays, whatever. We will be able to take it, okay? Uh -huh. Right, so now, uh, again, PET, since the beginning, is trying to show the way of circularity. The, indu the industry has integrated recycling centers we're working hard to collect, recycle, and return to uh, to the market PET resin, which is truly circular. 
and to bring success to, to the EU plastic strategy initiative and to enhance and build the PET resin business, the sector requires growth for investment, volumes for scale, basic encouragement, rather than control to lower volume. So, uh, <coughs> thank you very much. Um, and lower volume, this is not a criticism, no? It's just that, as I said, this directive is, for us is a fantastic opportunity. And really, it's the best opportunity we ever had. And as I said, being a, having been a recycler for more than 20 years, having financed many EPRs, okay, because we lost money, uh, at long last, I think we will have uh, the tonnages. And, it, and uh, so what I've said is just that the criticism is just that those PT trays, if we can, Try to, we have to try to collect that they are eco-designed to be recycled, like all the bottles are eco-designed to be recycled. We will show that later on to you. Huh? Uh, only 50% are collected. And, and uh, again, I wish to thank you all for coming here and also for this SUP directive, so we Thank you very much. We have still have three speakers, so I'm if uh, rattle on without too much introduction. Our next speaker is Jan de Velde, who is Principal Scientist for Sustainable Packaging Development at Procter & Gamble, where he's helped drive initiatives within the company and throughout the value chain. He's currently leading a pioneering project on the standardization of markers and watermarks in packaging to increase efficiency in sorting and recycling. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for the introduction. So indeed, my daily job is still packaging development within um, Procter & Gamble, so I'm focusing full-time on sustainable packaging. Uh, today I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Petcor, so within Petcor I'm part of the, uh, of the board, but I also have established this ODR group that uh, Christian was uh, referring to, so that's opaque and difficult to recycle pack packaging. So that's basically what I'm, uh, I'm going to talk today, and I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the need for cross-value chain collaboration. Okay. So let's start with trying to identify the weaknesses in current system, right? So this is just the, my five pillar approach. I hope everyone can see it. So there are basically five pillars, I believe, that we need to investigate and uh, identify the weaknesses and trying to find solutions for those weaknesses. The first one is really designed for circularity, right? So we need to design products that can easily be collected and recycled. The second one is then access to collection. And again, I think in the majority of member states, there is a kind of collection system in place. Um, and obviously, um, I'm also liking uh, the Belgian system the best, not because I'm a Belgian, um, but I think it's one of those uh, systems um, that are offering us very high qualities and quantities at a relative good cost. Okay? So that's an important one as well. The third one is then participation by, by consumers, right? And that's really uh, a real bottleneck today, and I think that's where uh, we as brand companies, but also to associations, we can build quite a lot um, in order to motivate more consumers to recycle more and better. The fourth one is that more is focusing on, on technology of sorting, and that's again the, the, uh, the case study that I, will, that I will talk. And then if you have everything in place, you basically end up with high quality recyclate for which you need to find end markets. Right? And again, that's, that's where the pledge comes into play, but also where our own sustainability targets within PNG are very important. So back in 2010, we announced that we would double the amount of PCR in our packaging globally. So by 2020, we actually will consume 52,000 pounds per year of PCR in our packs. Right? So those are the five pillars. Now, so let's have a look where the weaknesses are. Right, so as Christian mentioned, the weaknesses are definitely collection, so we're not collecting enough in, in Europe. So Christian mentioned an overcapacity, so basically what it means that is that recyclers cannot fill, fill in their plants, right? So that's, that's what we mean with an overcapacity. And then obviously there is an, um, an issue, or at least a weakness also in sorting, so we need to find new technologies to sort those packs more efficiently. Okay? So having a look to the weaknesses, so the first one, Design for Circularity, there is definitely a lack of harmonization of, of general principles, right? The, the real problem here is that every member state is using other collection rules. And for us as a global brand owner, or at least if, even if you look regionally, we tend to produce SKUs, bottles, um, for the region, not for specific countries, right? So this lack of harmonization is really giving us quite a lot of issues to find out the best material for the whole region. 
The second one is again access to collection. As I already mentioned, there is no harmonized system. So whatever we call recyclable in, in, in Germany is sometimes not recyclable in, in, in Belgium or in Germany, right? So again, harmonization of, of collection. So everywhere the same rules in all the member states would definitely help. Uh, definitely would help a lot of brand owners to design the right thing. A third one is then indeed lo a very low consumer participation. As I said, that's I think where the brand owners and the associations can, can focus on a lot. But also the EPR schemes, right? Again, I take the example of Fosplus. If you see all the media campaigns of like, if you collect so many um, bottles, I can make you a fleece or I can make you whatever it is. I mean, that's, that's very inspiring for consumers because indeed some, some consumers are just asking like, why, sh why the hell should I recycle, right? So telling them why it's important to recycle is also very key. I will talk a little bit about the, the sorting as mentioned later on. Um, and then also quality systems, right? So we need to have quality systems for the, the collected bills, the collected recycles and so forth. So I think if you have if, if you work all of these items in, in parallel, then obviously we're gonna reach much uh, easier um, the uh, circular economy for plastic packaging in general. All right, so those are the four points. What I'm gonna do next is I'm just gonna showcase uh, you two cross-value chain collaborations we have been uh, leading. One is more focusing on, on the first part, on collection, and as mentioned, the second one is more focusing on, on sorting this, okay? So again, the real objective is to increase recycling rates overall okay so let's have a first one on this one so this is one that we have been working in my ODR opaque and difficult to recycle um, working group is in pet core so opaques is basically all the milk containers in PET and the white opaques uh, colorful opaques but also sleeved so a sleeve bottle is something you see here and here so a sleeve is basically you're covering the full area of a bottle right so that's what, what the sleeve is and this is a very fast growing market especially in our industry, but also in the drinks industry, right? So this is something that we need to crack very fast. So the concept here is that the earlier you remove that sleeve, the easier it's, it's gonna be for sorting and recycling, right? Because unfortunately, these things are not properly detected today, okay? So they're ending up in waste streams and unfortunately, the majority is being incinerated, right? So we developed the concept of these perforated sleeves, as you can see here and also on the slide, with a consumer message, okay? So, so we're asking our consumers to remove the sleeve before they sort it out and before they uh, collect it back in their blue bag or whatever um, system there is in, uh, in place. And for this one, we also got uh, the Greener Packaging Award from uh, FOSS Plus two years ago. Um, because what we basically have been doing is we moved out of the, these bottles used to be white opaques, again, also challenging for recycling them. We removed the colorants and instead we have been implementing this uh, sleeve concept. So the bottle underneath is a transparent PET bottle, which is perfect for recycling, right? And on top we have been loading these bottles with 50% recycled content as well, okay? So we believe this is today the best solution we are having in the portfolio. Um, and the good thing is that also others have been following us, right? So I was glad to see that uh, other companies are just reapplying this, uh, this concept. And already in Italy, for example, we are, uh, we are getting uh, incentives to do this, right? So incentives by means of uh, bonus systems on, on the EPR. So that's basically how we can drive. Now, we have to educate all of the consumers to do this, right? So that's, uh, that's another good reason why if more people are, are copying this, this concept, uh, the more we can reach out to them, the more people will do this. They do this, sorry. So in Japan, for example, all the Japanese consumers are already doing this by default, right? So we really need to educate our consumers, especially if you look to the shelf. So this is just, again, a shelf picture of, of fabric enhancers in general, but you see it's all colorful bottles, all sleeve bottles whatsoever. So imagine all of these and already quite a lot have been converted into the perforated sleeve. So now it's really up to us to educate consumers. And it needs to be much more than just a text, what we are have put in here. Uh, we all agree on that one, right? Because there's still, we estimate that around 30% of the consumers are actually doing this today, right? So the good news is that two weeks ago, we have received conditional approval from the, the body called European Pet Bottle Platform. So basically it means that if you um, um, follow these, these rules, the bottle will be called out recyclable towards the future, right? So it's all about 
working together as an industry, and that's basically what we will do through uh, associations like AZ, the Association of Detergents, and Cosmetics Europe, so that's more beauty. So we're all gonna come together and we're gonna align on one and the same perforation message and consumer message, right? So that's really trying to drive, okay. So a second cross-value chain collaboration, as mentioned, is then more focusing on, on sorting. So this is basically how sorting works. So this is the blue bag. It's, it's uh, spread over a very fast, uh, very fast belt, right? Three meters per second. And then we are trying to identify the bags based on the infrared and trying to sort out. Now, if you look to these type of things, it already goes wrong, right? There are other things that you cannot detect, like black packaging, right? So it's, it's not detectable by near infrared and loads of other things. So there are EFSA guidelines that you can only have like 5% of non-food bottles in the bills. Again, near infrared <coughs> does not offer solutions, right? So we're looking into other ways to, uh, to do the sorting, and that's the reason why I've established this pioneering project within the new plastics economy. Again, I'm just gonna speed up. But these are all the companies I mentioned. So it's a very cross-value chain, so brand owners on top, waste manufacturers like uh, US Veolia are, are in there. And very important also the machine vendors, the biggest one in Europe are Pelang and, and Tobra on this one, right? And what we are trying to do is basically investigating different ways to make the packaging more intelligent. Whoops, and I'm just going to show you one thing. So this is now just, we are putting some things in the back and we're able actually to detect it by means of my standard smartphone, right? So I just can scan it and it gives me a signal, right? <coughs> Oops. So this is basically what we would like to do on implementing a unit after these existing sorting machines and making it very intelligent. So this is basically a complete new way of sorting uh, the packages. Okay, so with that I think it's, uh, it's, it's time to, to pause here. So I'm available for uh, questions later on. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Innovation, design. Absolutely key, I think. Uh, now, our next speaker is Patricia Kossler, who has been Secretary General of the European Federation of Bottled Waters since 2005. Her organisation represents 28 national trade associations and has direct company members representing 550 natural mineral and spring water producers. Thank you very much, and thank you very much uh, to PECO and Inspirati for, for hosting this meeting and giving us the opportunity to uh, work together and, and discuss important issues which is sustainability and the, the reuse of our packaging. Um, just to... Um, just to let you know in a nutshell who we are, basically UAPW is a federation of national trade association uh, with also some direct company members. The sector collectively has been represented since 1953. And uh, today we represent uh, around 550 producers. This is to give you an idea of the countries where we are represented. You will see that in some instances there are some countries that are beyond the EU. This is because um, outside of the EU, you see Georgia for instance, there are some countries with a very strong thermal tradition and uh, a very um, well established mineral water production. We also have some laboratories to assist us in our scientific work. Now when you talk about, oh, we have a bit of a, a, of a problem there. So I will, um, in blue, you see the market share of the uh, bottled water sector in Europe, and uh, basically it's 48%. So if you take all non-alcoholic beverages, bottled water represents almost half of the market today. Now, what is it that we drink in Europe? You all often hear this, this term, bottled water, which basically does not inform you very much about what consumers go for on our continent. Basically, 97% of what is in bottled water in Europe is either natural mineral water or spring water. This is totally different from other continents. We're talking about Waters that come from protected underground origin uh, must be originally pure at source, uh, may not be disinfected, may not be transported in tankers. Why am I saying this? What is the characteristic that lies beyond that? It's uh, protection. Protection of catchment uh, is absolutely critical and environment protection is really at the heart of this business because basically 
if you need to demonstrate for a natural mineral water original purity, meaning absence of contamination at source, it means that you have to um, develop uh, a whole policy in order to make sure that contamination doesn't reach your underground water sources. So very close link to environment protection because no corrective measures are available to this sector. Um, now, of course, something that's important to say as well, we often uh, talk about hydration. We know that uh, consumers don't drink enough, actually. EFSA issued some guidelines in uh, um, relation to hydration, and water clearly is, whether it comes from a bottle or from the tap, doesn't make any difference. It's a very healthy way of satisfying those needs. Now, what about packaging? Basically, our sector is using three types of packaging, PET, plastic, glass, and aluminum. All fully recyclable materials. And you know it, producers of uh, non-alcoholic beverages has been the first in setting up national recovery schemes. We were mentioning the Belgian one recently. Um, PET is a good player, is, uh, is first in class when it comes to polymer collection, reaching now 58%. And uh, Jan mentioned a moment ago uh, the uh, PET bottle platform. We co-founded that with Petco, the recyclers, Unesa, etc. What is it? It is a platform that issued recycling guidelines and which is screening new packaging to be launched on the market to ensure that they are fully recyclable. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the efforts towards uh, packaging light weighting. Um, I made a an exercise yesterday actually because we you should know that we package now 1.5 liter of water with just 24 or 25 grams uh, of plastics i bought uh, just 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 for testing a packet of chewing gum yesterday which has almost the same amount of plastic to package 47 grams of chewing gums uh, fully opaque and non-recyclable so uh, we do a good job at using very little amount of material and yet manage to protect the purity of the product. Oh, there we have uh, more problems. I, I didn't expect this. Um, okay, <laughs> no, sorry, it's fine. Voila, so I just described to you the credentials of the sector when it comes to environmental protection and choice of packaging, and yet, yet this has already been mentioned, uh, we have a kind of smack in the face there with some bottles ending up where they shouldn't be, simply because in some countries there's virtually no collection at all, and let's face it, even in Europe where there are collection systems, we can do much better. So what we would like to see really is this nicely knitted, uh, nice neat and clean PET bales ready for recycling. No packaging definitely should end up uh, as litter because I mentioned it, everything is recyclable. And not only is it recyclable, but it also has a value. We mentioned the Belgian system. I know that the sale of recycled material is uh, contributing to a very large extent to the functioning of FOS Plus, meaning uh, beverage cans and, and beverage bottles. Now, um, looking at the situation about two years ago, our board um, reflected very much on the situation and how to improve it and uh, made a pledge, made a pledge towards collecting 90% and towards reusing 25% in close loop, which is now uh, very much at the heart of the sub-proposal. And also innovation, there's a lot of innovation in the sector going on to find uh, alternatives to non-fossil based fuels, which of course is very important. And last but not least, let us not forget that because even in well-functioning, uh, even in countries with well-functioning EPR system, there is a lot of litter. Um, I mean, this is why um, there is pressure to uh, switch to, to other collection systems because consumers are not aware of their role towards ensuring um, the, the circularity of their packaging. Now, we also answered positively to DG Growth's call for um, commitment on RPT use. So, so far, we have, with our members, pledged 135,000 tons of additional RPT use. Um, it's a continuous process, meaning that in June, we had a certain amount. 
uh, and every time we have internal meetings, smaller companies join in the effort. So it's a growing number. Um, I, I, I know that perhaps it was a little bit disappointing to see some sectors come with a low number, but you know it takes some time to reach. Uh, you know there there are some companies that you can. Uh, take on board quicker than others and uh, smaller members have joined us. You, you should know that our sector is extremely fragmented. Uh, we have 2,000 sources with a lot of very small companies in remote areas and they are joining the, the effort uh, progress progressively. Then, of course, to achieve these goals uh, and those stated by the sub, which we very much encourage um, and in particular the focus on, on, on collection, of course, there are important preconditions. We've discussed already, and Christian mentioned it, uh, availability and quality, needless to say, is absolutely critical for our sector, meaning good sorting. Why is that? Because we're packaging the most uh, delicate product of them all. Um, so voila, if we want to really meet the sub-targets uh, and, and our own pledges, um, a topic that I think Christian mentioned also, we need a baseline. We need um, sector-specific data, meaning reliable data bearing only on PET buzzers, because if there are objectives related to beverage packaging, we need to have the, the data and not mixed with trays or with opaque uh, non-food bottles. That's very important for us. We don't uh, have that uh, yet. Of course, we need a dramatic increase in the efficiency of waste management systems across the EU. Needless to say, we need value chain cooperation, and I think we're starting on a very good footing uh, this year uh, in that respect. We need consumer uh, education, and we very much need as well, and the Commission is helping uh, us a lot in that respect. Uh, we need a facilitating regulatory context. What does that mean? Approval of RPT processes. Commission is working on that and about to finalize, I think. And, of course, standard for the quality of RPT. We want high-quality RPT that can be used uh, and reused for food purposes. Of course, we need harmonized standards. So, how do we get there? Um, I think it's been said many times, there is only one essential key for success, and that's collection, collection, and collection. How do we do it? Whether we do it with curbside system, traditional EPR, reverse vending machines, uh, with the deposit systems, uh, that's not what matters. What matters is what works best in one specific country. We know that uh, Belgium and Switzerland uh, on the one hand, Nordic countries and Germany on the other hand, show that both systems can work. Um, and of course, uh, there is a need not only to collect but also sort, so that indeed the circle can be achieved. Voila, just I wanted to commend uh, a recent initiative by the European Commission. It's uh, Vice President Katainen's initiative to put us all together in one room and uh, tackle the matter and see how we can collaborate to achieve the, uh, the perfect circularity of our fully recyclable materials. So that's a fantastic initiative and we're very uh, happy to be, to be part of it. Thank you very much. All coming together, I think it's very interesting. Well, our final speaker is Sarah Nellen, who's head of unit at the Waste Management and Secondary Materials at the DG Environment and the Commission. And before that, I had also responsibility, I think, for Waste Management and Resources with Mr. Timmons. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, well, what else can be said? I think the main messages uh, are out there. And uh, I can perhaps zoom in on uh, the last one that was uh, mentioned uh, three times collection, collection, collection. Um, and I will try to give you a few elements on what is on the Commission's agenda uh, in order to help out on that. Um, as we know, too much plastics, and especially also plastic packaging, lost um, for the economy, going uh, into the environment, being littered or landfilled or incinerated at its best with wasteful energy, for uh, wasteful energy process. Um, the challenge of collection is, I think, a challenge of um, the basics of modern waste management. We are trying, um, with the revised European uh, 
legislation um, to get improvements. We're not only looking at the future and the, the targets, the new ambitious targets for 2025, 2030, 2035 that will help to drive the processes. We're also looking currently um, at the implementation of the legislation that already was on the table. And in a report in September, unfortunately, we've seen that half of our member states are at risk of not achieving the municipal recycling targets for 2020, which doesn't put them obviously in a good position for 2030. So we're helping out on that as well, trying to make um, the link between waste management and the circular economy much better than before. We have high level missions to uh, these member states involving the participation of uh, Vice President Katayan as well, but also Commissioner Lola uh, <coughs> is uh, going to the countries, taking along businesses, so it's also an invitation to those who are interested to join and to make clear uh, on the ground what the importance is of separate collection and uh, waste management infrastructure. Please contact us and we are happy to uh, take you along to spread the message. Um, the revised uh, legislation has these more, object, more uh, ambitious targets. There is already an obligation as well of separation of um, plastics since the separate collection of plastics since 2015, but obviously it's not enough uh, implemented yet, uh, notwithstanding efforts, and we don't see plastic yet at the same level uh, of collection as the other uh, obligations in terms of paper, metals, uh, and gloves. And that is our aim, that is where we want to go. Um, the new legislation has clarified, um, in terms of separate collection requirements, um, some of the derogations, where actually in the previous uh, versions the derogations were kind of the rule. We've reversed the situation, separate collection is the rule, and derogations have to be an exception. So commingling will be much stricter. It cannot be done if there is not a comparable quality output. There will be, or there are specifications in the legislation on the notion of separate collection when it's technically, environmentally, and economically practical, which was in the past perhaps um, too wide an excuse for doing things that don't help with uh, quality um, collection. And uh, the Commission will come out, and that is planned for the end of this year, uh, we will come out with new guidance on separate collection to help the implementation. We've heard the call from businesses here as well, for more harmonization, this will be an effort from our side to help as much as possible into uh, more harmonized approaches, of course, within the limits of the legislation that we have. And um, there will be a special focus on plastics as well on that, uh, in that guidance uh, later in the year. What is good as well is in that the new legislation requires member states to report to the Commission by 2021 on how they see separate co their separate collection obligations. Though, so there is also a kind of um, follow-up in, in how they will implement this in their legislation specifically, how they um, see the new requirements. And that's in a one-off report in 2021 that is uh, due by then. Of course, the legislation has a more strict uh, plastic packaging target, uh, with uh, a target of 65% by 2030. And we're working on the new calculation methods, as I speak, because after this I have to rush to a whole day meeting with member states on um, the draft implementing acts on the new calculation rules, um, which will focus now on how really we measure what is recycled effectively which is shifting calculation points uh, from uh, just sorting to really input to recycling. So this is also um, methods to ensure that the um, ambitious targets that we have are really implemented in the right way and measured in the right way. A word as well about one of the other instruments that we think is an important tool in um, waste management and um, getting better uh, sorting and collection, EPR. And there as well, the new legislation has reinforced uh, this tool at European level with minimum uh, requirements that uh, hopefully, that we trust, will play a role in more effective EPR systems uh, in the whole of Europe. We have the Post Plus and the Belgian example. We hope that they can be a model for other uh, countries in Europe to um, have um, effective EPR 
collections, what we see is that those countries with um, high <coughs> separate collection and um, uh, recycling rates are those with good EPR systems in place. So this is important, um, that the collection and treatment costs for packaging are, are uh, financed through contributions paid by the producers and driven in an effective way. Um, of course, we have those tools, but I have to reiterate the point of many others before, design, 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 really an important element as well, uh, with a view to recycling, design for recycling. Um, there, the Commission is working hard as well on a review of the uh, essential requirements in the packaging legislation. These are the requirements for packaging to be allowed on the market in Europe, but we have seen from regulations in the past and from experience uh, and feedback as well from industry that actually they are not a great driver or incentive today towards uh, more um, recycling. They are very vague uh, and we want them to really be uh, an instrument to incentivize sustainable, sustainable reuse and recyclable packaging. This is also the commitment that is clearly expressed in the Commission's plastic strategy of last year by 2030, all plastic packaging in Europe should be completely recyclable, reusable or recyclable in a cost-effective way. And this is our tool to work on that, on design um, requirements. Um, another element that goes hand in hand on design, Ellen, on design, and I think uh, there have been references before, uh, experience in some member states exists already modulation in of fees. Um, this becomes now an obligation through the new waste um, legislation that the fees are modulated and higher fees for non recyclable products. Positive way, lower fee for uh, good design requirements. We will come out uh, with uh, guidance on that as well, looking at best practices existing already in some of the member states. These are uh, a number of, I know time is running out. I will just say perhaps two words on. One of the uh, uh, hard-fought uh, achievements of last year, I spent the uh, 18th of December uh, through the night in the uh, single-use plastic, the suburb, suburb negotiations, and of course it is a directive that is now just finalized by the Lord of Linguists, we're almost there, normally adoption in Council, I think, uh, in April. And of course, it doesn't stop there. Our uh, list in the Commission of implementing acts is long as well. I think we went into the negotiations with the acts. We come out with much more if you put the co-legislators together. But we're working hard on that as well. And related to PET, of course, the importance of um, how will we measure and verify the recycled content. So this is also work uh, that is on our plate. A bit more time than one year for that. Fortunately, we come with an increase by 2022 on that. Um, we will come as well with guidelines on the the um, the real the, what exactly the products are that are covered by the legislation because there has been some confusion, for instance, on what are the food containers. I can say that it's focused on the items that are littered. So we're not talking about big packs, uh, food uh, packaging uh, for families, etc. We're really talking about those items that risk to be littered, so not the ones uh, where food is packed in uh, food containers that need uh, heating in a microwave, etc. So we're, we're, we've come out with more uh, clarity and examples on that as well. Perhaps I cannot close, uh, as a head of unit of waste management uh, issues, I cannot close with a wider message on, yes, recycling, but the waste hierarchy, of course, has different layers. And I have to mention as well, the waste prevention angle first, and that is, of course, why also the single-use plastic directive foresees some bans of products or reduction targets, such as in food containers, because we believe that a lot of alternatives, reusable alternatives, are out there and if we want to really work towards um, 2050 very ambitious climate agenda and the March of Universities every Thursday show the excitement and the commitment of you to that as well, we also look at, we have to look as well at the waste prevention angle and um, the SIP legislation also covers that. Uh, and that is important from the perspective of the low carbon economy as well. <coughs> Thank you very much.
complicated period, and I think you managed to get through a heck of a lot there. Well, uh, it's, it's almost come to the end of the time, and uh, but be, before we do, I just want to say, first of all, I think we've heard some wide-ranging topics about EPR, supply, demand, challenges, end markets, design, and communicating about those designs. We've heard about public pressure, we've heard about the responsibility from brands and the value chain, innovation and technology, chemical recycling, for example. And, and, and also, I think what I've got from it is a sort of collective shared will. And so I've sort of come down to one word, right, to crystallize it, which I think is collaboration. You know, it is, it is a collaborative effort. So finally, for me, <coughs> thanks to Petcor for putting on today's event and also a reminder of the next one, which is sort of part two for today on the 20th of March. But uh, I'm sure afterwards there's a few minutes to mingle, but to finally draw things to a close, if I could invite Marie to come back for two minutes, otherwise they're going to throw us out. Take the time. Two minutes. Well, First of all, it is important for having you all here. When we have legislation, we have the strategy, we have the directive concerning simply with plastic, but we need more. Not to overlap, but to facilitate and clarify the needs that we have. We have to bridge the gap of lack of harmonization. Harmonization of collections in all member states is quite important. And we have to focus on plastic. Uh, we need numbers, numbers not only to improve the collection system, but numbers to, imp to approve the implementation. Concerning collections, I will focus on it, collection, 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 to increase the number of collections by educating people, by starting from schools, by engaging local communities, by engaging local authorities. And also, with market-based model, uh, I would like to use an example coming from Finland, when you collect, when you are a kid, if you collect 10, 10 plastic bottles, then you will win an ice cream. But I, I would like to say that there are a lot of market-based models in order to, to, to renew the, the, the interest on in collections. And of course, EPR schemes are needed, EPR schemes are, are needed to collaborate, and the Belgian model is extremely important. We have funding coming from FC, funding coming from MFF, coming funding coming from Horizon, we have technologies and we can see a business opportunity, a huge potential of business opportunity in order to collect and to recycle plastic. But allow me to conclude with this, it, it comes from my previous life and we need more communication. We need more communication in order to start communicate the need that we have to collect single-use plastic. We need more more communication and we have to invest in communication, starting with the Commission, starting with the Parliament, by large campaigns, and of course, involving the industry. You need to invest more in communication. Once again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.